the clean version that various free market economists advocate is getting rid of all programs the federal government has that require you to be below a certain income. And now some people then say that includes Medicaid, other people don't. Uh But even if it includes Medicaid, it would require a substantial increase in taxes. And so the number I came up with, this was back in 2014, it would obviously have to be adjusted. I think I came up with an extra trillion dollars a year, something like that. And so (laughs) that's a large number. And of course, it would be larger now because those were $2,014 Uh and there's been a lot of inflation. And so that- Can I just stop you, David, just to make sure the the listeners, so you're saying if you took what their proposal was, so everybody should get this much, you know, per year from the federal government, Right. You multiply by how many recipients there would be, and then you subtract out and say, oh, but spending would be lower because we wouldn't have food stamps. We wouldn't have blah, blah, blah. Right. We wouldn't, even if you included Medicaid, which is generous since some people yeah. want to keep Medicaid flowing, you're saying on net, as of 2014 with the proposals, the federal government would end up spending a trillion dollars more per year. Right. Okay. Right. And it's now more than a sure. trillion. Mm-hmm. And so then... I mean, what that means is, so this guy, Matt Zwolinski, recently wrote about it, and his defense was kind of eye-popping to me because he said that a, fi- a $500 per month UBI, which is only 6000 a year, would keep the ratio of U.S. government spending to GDP below Nordic levels, below levels in Scandinavia, below 1000 per month. UBI, which is the more typical one, would vault us ahead of Denmark and just behind Finland and France. And it's like, he seems all right with that. Mm -hmm. And that was what was so striking to me. We've got this huge federal deficit, and it's not because taxes have been cut substantially. They've been about 18% of GDP on average since the Korean War. It's because spending has gone up and is now around 24% of GDP. And we're now talking about a huge new spending program when our deficit is five to 6% of GDP without that program. That's what strikes me as so weird about this discussion among free market types. And just to be clear, when Zelensky is saying that about like, what the impact would be of a 500 and then you're doubling it to a 1,000. Is he building in if we implemented that and then got rid of the other stuff? Yes. So, okay, so then this kind of... Now, scripts. I've forgotten whether he gets rid of Medicaid. Okay, but that's the only thing that made, that's, that you're yeah. unsure of. But for sure, yeah. when he says 500 a month only puts us, you know, it, I forget what you said, behind France or something. Yeah, uh, yeah. Ab- or yeah. In, the, in the middle of the Nordic country, something like that. Yeah, yeah. That means, yeah. yeah, we go ahead and start paying everybody 500 a month, but we phase out food stamps and WIC and well, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, then, yeah. so this kind of then goes and circles back to the original issue we raised is how could they do that? Because, yeah. you know, someone right now who's getting, I mean, for people to intuitively understand the reason this is a problem is right now there's a certain group of people living in the United States who are receiving many thousands of dollars a month in various types of support, whether it's literal cash or like subsidy, you know, implicit subsidies, like they charge lower rent on public housing than the market would bear if it was, you know, private landlord, that kind of stuff. And then instead of that, we're like now saying everybody is going to get the same dollar amount. So you have to reduce the number. Otherwise, the total expenditure goes through the roof. But then if you do it so to keep the numbers manageable, if you dial it down to only 500 a month, well, then now what happens to people, you know, some single mother with three kids, she can't support them on $500 a month. So how right. can you phase out everything else? Like that's not right. going to work. Right. That's right. That's right. And I want to go back to something they don't ever talk about. And I wish I'd talked about it a little more in my 2014, 2015 article. And that is welfare reform. Because... This cliff issue has been understood 
since before I was a graduate student. Mm -hmm. In other words, these in, implicit tax rates and can be close to 100% that you lose so much, you lose about a, a dollar per dollar you earn past some, past some point. Mm -hmm. And that's why Friedman came up with this thing in the 60s and so on. But in the 90s, there was this bipartisan agreement. This was when Newt Gingrich was in Congress and Clinton was the president. He was doing what he called triangulation, and it really was triangulation. And they got together, and at first Clinton didn't like it, but he, he ended up going along with it. Of welfare reform, where you think of welfare as being this temporary thing, so you can't be on it for more than two years in a row, and you can't be on it for five years in the total of your lifetime. And that was why, they, that was their solution. You still have the cliff, but if you've used up, you can think of the five years as being kind of a checking account. Ooh, I better not use it all now because there's a limit. And there were all these predictions of people being out on the street and so on, and welfare reform worked extremely well. And so people said, oh, you know, we got a fairly good economy right now. I'm going to get off welfare make money, and then I've kept my years of eligibility. Mm -hmm. But bit by bit, the feds and various state governments have undercut that, made it so it doesn't really mean what it was supposed to mean in the mid-90s and so on. But that has to be pointed out because it's not as if people never had a response, a kind of a sensible response, in my view, to the welfare cliff problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Again, are you, are you comfortable? Because that's the, the thing, from my point of view, the issue is to make the numbers even plausible where this isn't just going to be ridiculous, they have to scale back the the floor. They you know, keep it pretty modest. Yeah. But then in that right. case, it's politically impossible. There's no way people are going to go along with really getting rid of all those other means-tested programs because then there are going to be people right now that the amount they get is going to go way down and they're going to yeah. stay, with, you know, and then it's, it truly is going to be a situation where somebody isn't going to be able to make ends meet. And then, right. so I, so in other words, it's, there's no way that that is going to work politically. Therefore, the, once we open up the floodgates, it's just, this yeah. is going to just be added on top of not a substitute for all the existing programs. Right. And then you think about, and this is an example I've given in, in speech, speeches, you think about, say, four guys who meet each other in college. And they aren't particularly ambitious. Mm -hmm. And they live in a fairly low-cost part of the country. That's not that hard to find. And if it's 1000 a month, that's 12000 tax-free. That's 48000 Let's say they're in good health, so they're not worried about health insurance. They can easily rent a four-bedroom house somewhere and just play video games all day. Now, would they do that the rest of their life? Probably not. But I think what it would do is delay becoming adults. Uh -huh. They might wait till they're 26 or 27 before they say, you know what, guys, I'm sick of this. I'm going to get a job. And so it's just like, I see all these problems that could be substantial problems that I don't see the proponents talking about. Okay. Right. I agree with that too. And then another thing too, in terms of the feedback effect, besides the implausibility of just what the proposals are, like at just face value, say this isn't, this wouldn't work politically. Why are we even analyzing this? But then for some, you know, if they did impose some version of it, I think also the problem is the feedback loop that, okay, once they have to, so given now that even on its own terms, especially in terms of like the progressive leftists who say there's a lot of people working, you know, terrible jobs right now that they could just have the freedom to quit and go, you know, write the yes. great American novel or, go back right. to grad school or, you know, whatever. Yeah. At least for a period there, that means there's going to be this extra strain on the system. And so middle class and upper income people are clearly going to have to be on net kicking in more to make the whole right. thing work. Right. Uh, and right. so, we, you know, whether that's literally taxing them more or just piling up more deficit that implicitly, you know, they're the ones on the hook for that if they're the net taxpayers. And so then right. won't that have incentive effects? Like on the right. margin now, won't some people, if they see their tax rate going up and the floor for not having to do anything is more generous now, won't more people who are current middle-class people, all of a sudden, won't their reported income go down, right. making the original numbers even less tenable? 
Right, that's right. Yeah. And then that's why Matt Swalinski, the philosopher I mentioned, says, okay, don't raise tax rates that much. Instead, phase out the subsidy. Mm -hmm. But then you have the standard incentive problem. And so I took an example recently in, in a blog post I wrote where you phase it out by 25 cents on the dollar. That's like adding 25 percentage points to your marginal tax rate. So if you're even in a, a 12% bracket at the federal level and say a 4% bracket at the state level, that's 16 and then it's 25, you've way more than doubled that modest income person's implicit marginal tax rate. And that's certainly going to affect incentives. The obvious incentives, incentive to work, but also the incentive to make money under the table on which the government collects zero taxes. So yeah, it just, I don't know, it just is weird to me. Can I tell you a personal story about, I was an advocate of Friedman's thing because Friedman could do no wrong in my view when mm -hmm. I was 20 years old. Mm -hmm. And I went to UCLA, I was 21, and I was TAing a class for an economist named Chuck Baird, and he was great. Mm -hmm. And he said, here's my solution to the welfare problem. And he laid out Friedman's negative income tax, and he did it really well. And there was this young undergrad, a bunch of us graduate students were become friendly with. And he came back to our office afterwards and said, this is great. I wouldn't have to work until I'm like in my mid-20s. And it's like, oh my God, like, I literally didn't think of this. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about the woman with a couple of kids mm -hmm. who's not married. And it's like, wow, that was quick. <laughs> and it's like, from then on, I was a skeptic. And mm -hmm. that's kind of, that's always been in my mind. I know it's one story about one person. Mm -hmm. But it's such a plausible story about potentially millions and millions of people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then also, too, just a weird quirk of Zolensky's Zool attempt to you know mitigate the problem. It's not a universal basic income anymore if he's phasing it out, right? I mean, that's that's right, the whole point. That's right. That's right. Well, he would argue, and I we got to give him his due. He would argue, yeah, it's not a universal basic income. But people, as during the phase out, if it starts at a certain income level, they're still going to be have have way more income than the someone who's just getting the UBI. That would be his argument, I think. Okay, I mean, you sh sure, and like whatever yeah. it is, we call the thing that he's suggesting. You know, we got to evaluate it on its merits. But I'm just saying, he yeah, is moving not, you know, away it's, from. Yeah, it's right. you know, sort of like you know when they first had communism and they had no money, and then you know, Lenin was like, okay, yeah, that's not working. Let's have some <laughs> form of money and. <laughs> right. Um, okay.